Quantum healing is a theory that a shift in consciousness creates a shift in biology. That's it. We try and get into every aspect of a patient's life, their relationships, their hopes, their dreams, and uh, then we combine it with a ritual of um, deep meditation, massage, and really a lot of spiritual counseling, including the fear of death. We think that uh, many times uh, patients uh, uh, feel healed even though they may die from a disease if they learn to go beyond their personal fear of death. And you can never do that unless you uh, have a patient have a spiritual experience. Where did the quantum theory come into that? Oh, it's just a metaphor, just like uh, an electron or a photon is an indivisible unit of information and energy. A thought is an indivisible unit of consciousness. Oh, so it's, an, it's a metaphor for a, for a unit. It's nothing to do with quantum theory as in physics. No, I think quantum theory has a lot of uh, things to say about observer effect. There are a school of physicists who believe that quantum leaps, for example, are examples of discontinuity. And uh, creativity in consciousness is also an example of discontinuity. And that healing may be a biological phenomenon that uh, relies on biological creativity, that at very fundamental levels it may be a discontinuous phenomenon. It's something unpredictable that happens in the proliferation of uncertainty. So it sounds like a sort of poetic use of the word discontinuity. It's, it's actually confusion, isn't it, to bring in um, quantum theory other than as a metaphor. But it sounds as though you're both doing it as a metaphor and a, a little tinge of, of something like what physicists are talking about as well. Well, I think there's controversy. The aficionados in the world of quantum physics have somehow hijacked the word for their own use. Oh, okay. So they've hijacked your word I quantum. think what happens is that there are fundamentalists in science. That is absolutely wrong. Science's quest is to try to sort out, to tease out those bits that we don't understand and work out. Science has become so arrogant in its, um, in its premise that it has all the answers in a mechanistic approach that it has, whilst it has gotten rid of lots of things like polio and malaria and tuberculosis in many parts of the world, uh, we are now seeing the emergence of modern epidemics that are a result of some of the things that have come about through science. Chopra at least wears his disdain for Western science openly. The rest of us are prone to politely blurring the vital distinction between science and mumbo jumbo. If you want to pay for unproven potions and use them in the privacy of your own home, all well and good. But such is the power of the alternative medical lobby that one seemingly bizarre remedy has become embedded in our National Health Service. Now I want to find out why we're all paying tax to fund other people's gullibility. I agree there is a plausibility problem, you know, and I pinch myself from time to time. I quite regularly pinch myself. You know, is this really happening? It's the hottest alternative health fad. It boasts an impressively vast and well-stocked medical cabinet it's endorsed by royalty and the stars and is doing a booming trade in high street pharmacies. 500 million people worldwide claim to use it. What is it? It's a system for dosing up on a dilute solution of water. Welcome to the bizarre world of homeopathy. Homeopathy was dreamed up in the late 18th century as a way of boosting the body's vital spirit. One of the central tenets handed down by its founder, Samuel Hahnemann, was that like cures like. Superficially, this might sound faintly plausible, but unlike a vaccine that introduces a diminished form of a virus into the body in order to provoke its immune system, like cures like makes the unfounded assumption that what causes similar symptoms can cure those symptoms. In Hahnemann's world, dilute poison ivy cures skin rash because, undiluted, it causes a rash if touched. By the same principle, red onion can alleviate streaming eyes and snake venom stiffness. But amazingly, homeopathy gets even stranger still. 
Homeopaths claim that the more you dilute an active ingredient in water, the stronger medicine it becomes. Most homeopathic remedies are marked 30C. What does that mean? It means one part medicine to a hundred to the power of 30 parts water. How much? A drop in a fish tank? No? A fish tank is nowhere near big enough. The swimming pool doesn't provide enough dilution. Not even a lake. What about a drop in the ocean? But it turns out that even the sea isn't big enough. For the really approved homeopathic recipes, in order to get one molecule of the active substance, you need to imbibe all the atoms in the solar system. To science, just doesn't make sense. Even homeopaths acknowledge that there is not a single molecule of active ingredient in the bottle they sell you. It's just water. So how can it possibly work? In an attempt to resolve the paradox, homeopathy boldly paddles further up the creek of pseudoscience, claiming that water somehow has a memory of the now completely absent active ingredient. But wouldn't water also have memory of other, more common impurities it's come into contact with? Salt, urine. Scientists have calculated that in each glass of water we drink, at least one molecule has passed through the bladder of Oliver Cromwell. Incredibly, you and I are paying for this unproven industry through our taxes. Despite the National Health Service's net £540 million deficit for 2006, the refurbishment of the Royal Homeopathic Hospital was part-funded by the NHS to the tune of £10 million. That's equivalent to 500 nurses' salaries. Right here on the floor, here's a point to illustrate. Wooden floors, very unusual in a modern healthcare facility. This hospital was only completed 18 months ago. So this is our main clinical area. The homeopathic profession is unregulated by government. You can call yourself a homeopath without any qualification, training or even insurance. After all, all you're doing is dishing out water solution. But Peter Fisher, clinical director of the hospital, is a medically trained rheumatologist. I see Prince Charles over there. Yep. Oh, yes, great friend of ours. <laughs> These are the, the homeopathic medicines that are in you know, daily use. This is one, you know, for instance, it has quite a strong evidence base, rust toxin, which is poison ivy. Right, OK. Um, I want to know how someone highly qualified in real medicine can make such a leap of faith. I agree there is a plausibility problem, you know, and I pinch myself from time to time. I quite regularly pinch myself. You know, is this really happening? You know, the fact is I couldn't stop what I do now, even if I wanted to. This, my patients wouldn't let me. Yeah. They said, help. So how are things? Well, very much better since we last saw you. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I virtually no pain at all. You know, if I'm aware of the symptoms are going to start again, I start taking it again and, and I can feel the improvement and then mm -hmm. I go back to it until I need it again, you know. Good. Oh, well, that's pretty straightforward. We just bash on the same, don't we? Yeah. I'm still taking the remedies, but you said to me, um, you know, if you get mini, if you get little reactions, mm. just hold off taking the remedies until they then yeah. subside. So therefore, I've been doing that. So, for example, I haven't had a remedy for a week now. And uh, last time we met, you said you were getting a bit of an emotional sort of upset yeah. the day after you took the, the medicine. It was the day after I took the medicine.